Good morning, everyone. I'm Jo Chataway and uh, welcome to this event. Uh, we are going to be talking for the next hour about using evidence-based models to uh, help achieve the SDGs and in particular thinking about uh, those evidence-based models in relation to science, technology, innovation and the SDGs. So I am going to, I, uh, that's me. Um, I'm going to be talking to uh, Erica Thompson and Jeff Mulgan about those issues and uh, we really hope that you will engage in the conversation, uh, put your questions in the Q&A and um, if that doesn't work in the chat function, uh, we hope this conversation will be uh, led in good part by you. I'll kick off with a couple of questions but then we'll, we'll hand over to you. Just before we start and before I introduce our speakers, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. So this event is being recorded uh, and if you want to remain anonymous you can, you can do that, you don't have to show your name. Uh, as I said the event will last for an hour um, uh, and please do contribute your questions to, to, uh, in the Q&A box. Um, uh, there is a general chat function too that you can use, but um, I'll look primarily at the Q&A box. Uh, we will have people looking at the chat function, so that, so that will work too. Um, I think that's it for uh, housekeeping. Aristea, do remind me about things I may have forgotten if there are things. Um, but right now I'm going to uh, move into welcoming our speakers. And thank you both for joining us this morning. Um, Erica Thompson. Uh, is uh, a senior policy fellow at the LSE Center for Analysis of Time Series. And her research interests center around the use of modeling and simulation to inform real world, real world decision making. And she's worked with various humanitarian agencies uh, and governments and insurance companies. So she has a lot of experience in this field um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you, Erica. Uh, Jeff Mulgan, Sir Jeff Mulgan, recently knighted in the Queen's Birthdays Honours List, uh, is a Professor of Collective Intelligence, Public Policy and Social Innovation, and uh, I work with Jeff, uh, we're in the same department, uh, the Department of Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy at uh, UCL. Uh, uh, before he joined us at UCL, uh, relatively recently he joined us, he was Chief Executive of Nesta, which is the UK's uh, innovation Foundation. Uh, he was uh, chief executive between 2011 and 2019. He's had roles in, in government uh, and in a diverse array of think tanks uh, and other organizations. Jeff, I will leave it there. There's a lot more we could say, but uh, I, I will leave it there. And if you think I've left out any um, important aspects of your biography which relate to this conversation, do of course mention them. As I said, I'm going to start by uh, asking Erica and Jeff two uh, questions. Um, and the first of those questions is just a very general one. Uh, we talk about modeling in, uh, and, and uh, the use of modeling is pretty ubiquitous in, in policy making, in some areas of policy making. But what, what, what does a good evidence based uh, model look like? What is it? What does it look like? Erica, start with you. Okay, thanks, Joe, and uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. It's really nice to have this discussion, and I'm looking forward to the questions because I understand we've got a very broad audience out there for this webinar. Um, okay, so what does a good evidence-based model look like? I, you know, it's a very general question and perhaps deceptively simple, and I think it has, uh, you know, many dimensions of interesting answers that we could give. Um, so I thought maybe I would uh, focus my answer around one, um, one sort of uh, framework for thinking about the quality of models and information, um, which was put forward about 20 years ago. Um, and this is the framework of salience, credibility and legitimacy. Um, so the, so these, these three axes of considering whether our model is a good model um, and salience, salience is all about whether the model does what users are actually interested in? You know, is it giving, is it predicting variables that we want to know about? Is it predicting something that we can actually use to help us um, achieve the sustainable development goals, either by uh, modifying policy or frameworks or institutions or behaviors? Is it, is it doing something that's actually relevant in the real world? Um, then credibility uh, is perhaps the thing that the 
that scientists like myself are most interested in, you know, it, it's that's about quantitative skill assessment saying, actually, can we demonstrate that this model, the information that we're getting from it is quantitatively useful in terms of actually, uh, you know, matching up with what we observe in the real world. And then the third dimension is legitimacy. Uh, and that is more about the procedure and the process of generating and communicating the information. So is it, is it perceived to be legitimate? Is it trusted by the intended users? Is it something that they will take and are able to able and willing to integrate into their decision making procedures? And also, does it involve stakeholders in setting priorities? So I think, I think that, you know, considering those three together, we can really easily imagine that something, if something is salient and legitimate, but not credible, it's no useful, it's not useful at all. If it's something is salient and credible, but not legitimate, it simply won't be used. Um, and if something is credible and legitimate, but not salient, then the users have no way to make use of it, even if it might be you know, information that is real information. It's not something that we can actually use to integrate into decision making. That's um, great. So I don't, do you want me to stop there? Or I could say a bit more about the trade-offs. Okay, just a little bit more about the trade-offs, that'd be great. Just a minute then. So I think, I mean, there, there are something that I focus on in my research is the, is the trade-offs between these different areas. So for instance, there's a trade-off between credibility and salience. We could say, uh, you know, we may gain more credibility by going into the quantification of uncertainty in a lot of detail, but that makes it less salient because perhaps we're overcomplicated, quite hard to understand. It's something that is difficult for users to integrate into decision-making procedures. Um, so for instance, predictions of global mean temperature, thinking about climate change, are very credible, but they're not very salient because nobody was ever killed by global mean temperature actually except for as an indicator nobody really cares about global mean temperature per se um yeah so i'll, I'll you know you can imagine other trade-offs i'll i'll leave it there and also maybe to to say that scientists tend to focus almost exclusively on the credibility aspect and the quality of data and the use of evidence to create and evaluate models but that that's only one part of the overall package that's such a useful way of thinking about it. Thank you, Erica. And I guess we may come back to that point about the way uh, credibility is, is perhaps privileged. Um, Jeff, I'd like to hand over to you. Well, well thanks. And I'm, I'm definitely not a very good modeler. I, I have written, done some models, but in the audience, we have far better people than me. But I have been a commissioner and user of lots of different kinds of models. And I guess building on what Erica said, I think it's useful to distinguish different kinds of models in terms of their purpose. So I think there is one family of models which are very much there to describe dynamic processes, uh, like climate change, for example, or the dynamics of an economy. And for those, obviously you need evidence, but you also need them to become highly complex, highly sophisticated, uh, coping with a reality which is always far more complex uh, than the model can be, even with massive supercomputing power. There's a second category though, which is almost the opposite, which you find quite often in economics, which is models used as almost as thought experiments, as tools for clarifying causation. And often those work best when they're very simple, almost deliberately simple, in order to sharpen a perspective on some, I say, some process, some causation, which is otherwise uh, not understood. And almost the best of those kind of models are, are almost absurdly simple and often ignore lots of complex evidence, but hopefully they help you think more clearly and they may help for mechanism design. So I mean, the Nobel Prize for mechanism design only a few years ago was for people who were modeling in that deliberately simplified way, which, which Milton Friedman actually theorized. Maybe we'll come back to him. There's a third kind of model, which is used for planning where you're trying to model inputs, outputs, and ideally outcomes. Uh, and uh, obviously, again, those do need to draw on, on evidence and facts and so on, because otherwise they're not, uh, they're not very useful. But again, if they become too complex, as Erica said, they may be very hard to be used in the implementing organization. So there the trade-offs kick in. And the same then applies when you use those models for tracking and adjusting implementation, since the results will always be slightly different from the plan, and then you're constantly iterating 
to improve uh, the model. So there's probably other categories as well, but I think it's important to distinguish what you're wanting the model to do, because that will then determine some of the design uh, features. I mean, I, I, I got very involved in this nearly 20 years ago when in the British government, uh, when I was then running the strategy unit, we attempted quite a big program for promoting modeling skills in civil servants. And we're trying to get almost every policy exercise to have some use of models, both for understanding uh, complex systems, but also then as a guide for implementation and understanding, again, inputs, outputs, uh, and outcomes, often in, in slightly crude ways. And I think the value there of having to model things was they force a certain rigor, a certain precision on what you think is happening. Often they reveal massive gaps in evidence, massive gaps in understanding. And then I guess the key thing for our the rest of our conversation is how you both value modeling as a tool for clarity of thought, uh, but how you also avoid the risk of fetishizing models where the reality, as I said, is always gonna be far more complex than the social science or any other science. Uh, and therefore the model can become a major problem. And this, of course, happened in economics with decades of modeling, which often caused as much uh, trouble as they uh, as they solved. And I think that's a dilemma now for all sorts of things from climate change modeling to things like digital twins, which are increasing use in business and now in cities and are a different kind of model, which may in the near term become very important for decision making but again, risks missing crucial factors and evidence, uh, which means they may legitimize bad decisions rather than encouraging good ones. That's great, thanks. And I guess my second question kind of um, picks up on, on the points you raised at the end there, Jeff. I want to bring the conversation back a bit to the SDGs because uh, you know our, our Strings project is concerned with uh, aligning uh, science, technology, innovation, research to, to, to the SDGs. So I, um, I wanted to ask you, what are the kind of, uh, what does good and bad look like in terms of uh, SDG related decision making uh, and, and how, do, how do evidence based models uh, relate to uh, well informed good SDG related policy making? What, what does that look like? Of course, it's a huge question, um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll have, you'll, you'll have perspectives on it. Erica, why don't we go back to you to start? Sure. Um, I guess I've got a few examples to share here. I mean, one that I wanted to start with was the one that hopefully everybody will be familiar with, um, that you know, one major impact on the achievement of the sustainability, the sustainable development goals going forward will be the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so just thinking about the role that models have played in the uh, formulation of policy and the understanding of how we go forward and how we deal with this situation. Um, you know, I think there are there are different models at play here and they influence the way that we think about the questions and the way that we frame the whole narrative of what is actually going on and what the problem is and what we can or can't do about it. Um, so, for instance, if we think about back in sort of February, March, April, when the uh, the SAGE scientists in the UK were thinking about um, how what sorts of interventions could be made and making uh, policy uh, relevant um, advice to the government about what could be done and what the impact would be. Um, I think it's interesting to sort of reflect on uh, the the use of that in the short term when obviously you know we think that we do have useful information in the short term if the input data are good enough then the the outputs over perhaps the next three weeks will be predictable and potentially useful. If you go further than that, then you're starting to get into the domain where actually you're so sensitive to the changes in initial conditions that the uncertainty ranges would just be huge and unhelpful. And um, and and then you can think of it sort of more as Jeff was saying, you know, are we using this model to predict and optimize a response or are we using it just to understand more about the situation? So, for instance, that um, reference scenario presented by uh, Patrick Valence and Chris Whitty a couple of weeks ago saying, you know, that it's going to go up 
exponentially if we do nothing. I think uh, the the public debate then about what that actually meant was interesting to see how people were interpreting that model and whether it was a, a prediction or a conditional prediction or just a, a sort of a scare tactic, if you like. Um, so I think there are interesting questions about how how these models actually frame the way that we think and respond. And obviously, you know, you could imagine as well that the uh, the the impacts on health and um, morbidity, mortality uh, rates are obviously not the only thing that's important at the moment. You know, there are there are huge other knock-on impacts of the COVID pandemic and of our response to it, which act in both directions, both positive and negative. Um, and we don't have a model for those. You know, if we had back in say, sort of February, March, April, a model for what the economic impacts of COVID would have been and the economic impacts of lockdown, I think that would have been super interesting to see how that might have framed the debate in a different way rather than just having these pictures showing, um, you know, the curve going up, going down again, a small number of possible interventions. So that's COVID. And then, I mean, maybe just, I mean, I've got several other examples, but I'll keep it fairly brief to say I've been uh, involved with um, short term forecasting of extreme weather events for humanitarian applications. Um, and again, there we see this trade off of salience and credibility that I described, you know, we want to make a forecast as early as possible of a potentially damaging event like a heat wave or a cyclone or a flood. Um, but the earlier you try to make that forecast, obviously, the greater uncertainty you have. So I think you're right, Joe, to distinguish between uh, good and bad use of models rather than good and bad models per se. It's not it's not the models that have this, you know, then they're, they're not good or bad in themselves, but the use to which we put them can be good or bad, depending on the situation. So. Um, you know, it may be good to make a forecast of an extreme weather event if that can help us to create frameworks and actually take action in advance of an event. So heat wave in Pakistan is one that I've been involved with. And that was we were able to find that there was enough information at an early stage to be able to do that and to save you know, lives and money relative to the default scenario of acting only after the event has happened. Um, but obviously it can also be bad because if we if we have a variable for which there isn't useful um, predictive skill, then maybe we're just diverting time and money to forecasting something that we can't really do uh, that's not useful for this particular stakeholder, even if it might be useful for other stakeholders. And at that point, it's actually negative because it's taking resources that could have been used for, say, tents or sanitation kits or things that actually um, help people. So I think there are really interesting questions of these trade-offs. And I suppose the main thing I wanted to highlight in that answer was that the, the good and bad use, there are many different kinds of uses and uh, none of them is unequivocally good or bad. It depends on the uh, what you're trying to do and what kinds of information you're trying to, to get and what actions you're trying to take. That's great, thanks Erica. So yes, how, how the models are used, how they're targeted, how they're uh, uh, focused and explaining the kind of limitations of what they can do, uh, what they can't do, really important. You also raised very interesting issues of kind of time dimensions and, ha and how important that is in, in thinking about the use of models. Um, yeah, I'm sure we can come back to, to a lot of uh, the issues that you raised there. Um, Jeff, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, well, maybe I'll attempt a few sweeping generalizations to get our <laughs> audience to, to, to disagree. So, I mean, the, the first one is, and maybe this is obvious, but maybe it's not, is certainly my understanding of things like integrated assessment models and all these other tools out there, is it's definitely the case that modeling of physical processes is far more reliable now than modeling of anything involving human beings. So that may be weather forecasting, which improves decade on decade, uh, um, volcanic eruptions, um, but also, um, you know, things like uh, uh, food, food dynamics, uh, famine, drought, etc. Whereas anything involving identity, behavior, etc. remains incredibly hard to model in any in any serious sense. Anyway, that's that sort of hypothesis one. The second one, I, I, I'm very influenced by people like Scott Page, um, who argues that for almost certainly any social phenomenon, 
if you only have one model, that's a bit of a problem. You do need multiple models, which can uh, argue with each other, interrogate each other, as indeed we've seen through the, the pandemic. And just a little comment on that model from two weeks ago, which Erica mentioned. My memory of it is it was a, it was a completely non-evidence-based model. It was essentially an arithmetical sort of uh, chart, which anyone could have sort of written on the back of an envelope, and maybe they had done. It was slightly odd in this context that uh, there was sort of no attempt, I think, if I'm right, in that, that, in that case, to link it to any real uh, evidence. And then a third generalization would be that I think, in certain relation to SDGs, the most useful models are the ones which in some ways are quite modest. They're trying to identify a particular phenomenon in a particular place in a particular time, see what we know. It may be again about the dynamics of some change to farming practice uh, or child nutrition, whatever it may be, where there is a you know some body of knowledge about the relationships of actions and inputs to outputs and, and outcomes, but done in a way which is also flexible enough so if you take a topic like you know, adolescent sexual health, it's so context specific, dependent on you know, dowries, cultural patterns and so on, that general models can really do a lot of harm, uh, but models which are uh, adaptable and customizable can be quite useful as, a, as, a, as almost as a shared language for those involved. By contrast, um, there have been various attempts at sort of meta models of, SDGs. The Millennium Institute, I think only about five years ago, was promising there would be this sort of grandiose model of everything. I remember years ago working in the British government and with the American government and the CIA and others who were attempting meta models which could predict, you know, state breakdown and everything else. And, you know, although those have a little bit of utility, they nearly always um, fail, <laughs> uh, essentially. Um, and, uh, and there's a sort of hubris in claiming that you can model a hi a highly complex interactions of ecology, social dynamics and economics, um, which we should be, uh, I'm, I'm a, still a bit surprised how often you hear people making these claims given the very poor track record of those grandiose models, but they, they don't seem to, to go away. So I'd count that as a sort of bad example because it then actually undermines the credibility of perfectly good and sensible models. But again, I'd love to hear views from our audience about um, just how humble should the modelers be and should they and how do they avoid not being too humble because uh, obviously there's a great utility in a sensible, useful evidence-based model. Okay, a lot to get our teeth into there. Um, I mean, I guess what one issue there, Jeff, is is the bal is a balance, isn't it? Because the, it, it, in some respects, the whole point of modelling is that you can generalise, isn't it? And, uh, uh, you know, the extent to which you can um, uh, credibly use uh, models based on very limited evidence base is, is also an interesting question. But we do have a, we do have a question. Uh, from Maria Savona um, from Spru, who says, thanks for unpacking a great topic. My question to the speakers is, what is your view, what in your view is uh, the single or multiple criteria, criterion to adequ adequately and exhaustively train future civil servants who should be able to uh, cover salience, credibility and legitimacy and produce and use evidence models to make a difference in their countries. I'm thinking for instance of Global South students who enroll in policymaking postgraduate masters in, in the UK. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's a, a good question from, from Spru and one that's relevant to I'm sure the LSE and, and UCL too. Uh, who wants to give some thoughts on that? You can give some thoughts if you like. Um, Great. I think, I mean, I think there is no single criterion and uh, I, it may not be possible to adequately and exhaustively train people in the use of models, I think. Uh, you know, the, the, more I, the more time I spend thinking about models, the more I think that actually the questions raised by the use of models really go very deep into a whole lot of philosophical questions about how it is that we uh, understand the universe and generate expert judgments about what's going on external to our own minds and how we formalize that into a, a mathematical model, which is actually meaningful. You know, we have a tendency to uh, to use these 
to see these mathematical models in uh, perhaps as being objective, you know, as being sort of scientific and having this uh, mathematical dressing, if you like, um, which makes them sort of look uh, separate and objective in, in some way. Um, and I suppose the, you know, I mean, from my point of view, maybe the, the single thing um, that I would like these kinds of people being trained for these kinds of jobs to understand is, is the degree of subjectivity in any kind of mathematical modeling that actually just because you dressed it up in maths doesn't make it um, you know the be all and end all that it's still subject to our value judgments and our priorities and our past experience and our uh, limited understanding um, so you know, Jeff used the word hubris, and I think it's quite right. And it maybe goes a little bit further in some instances that actually we end up in in groupthink. But, you know, because the model is seen as being an independent confirmation of what we already thought, but actually the model is really, in some cases, it's only a mathematical expression of what we already thought. Um, now, obviously you don't want to throw away your models completely because as we've all seen, they are incredibly useful and incredibly helpful in framing and understanding these situations and getting a better handle on it. Um, so I, I don't really have an answer to Maria's question, uh, but I think that it's, it's not a simple question um, and starting to unpack some of those issues a bit more, um, maybe training in, in just having a go with modeling some of these complex systems and, and, and seeing how difficult it is and how and the, the ways in which the, the kinds of assumptions that we make propagate through into large uncertainties in the output. So I think that would be really useful as a, as a very basic starting point, but there's a huge amount that you could do. Great, thanks. Jeff, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, in a, in a way, this was the, the, the problem we, we faced or version of this with the cabinet office nearly 20 years ago is, is what, who needs to be trained in what way. And there's, I think, two very different sets of answers. There's the people who will be building the models. Uh, and for them, obviously, there's a set of uh, technical skills in model building. And it's you know quite important that they know the variety of different modeling approaches all the way up now to um, the very sophisticated end of things like um, uh, yeah, uh, weather forecasting uh, or, or, or digital twins of a whole uh, city. And, and the techniques there are different now from, significantly different from 10 years ago. But we focused probably even more on the users, uh, the civil servants, less so the ministers, who might be um, presented with a model or might be using it to help make decisions or, or track a policy. And there, I think the key, as Erica said, is, is you know, a, a healthy skepticism in the, the, the confidence to ask some fairly basic questions about the model and what lies behind it. You know, where is the data from? What is the status of the evidence which guides the various sort of causal elements uh, of the model? How generalizable is it across um, space and time? And, and how do you know how generalizable it is? You know, how, what are actually the results of any predictions it's made? And how, I mean, crucially, it's the question, how would you know if you were wrong? Which is the question we should always ask uh, of pretty much anyone. And I think as, as Peter Gluckman said in the, in the chat, that almost the, the risk of models, that they can look so fantastically impressive, especially with good visualization methods, that they sort of browbeat people into, into submission. They look much more, much stronger than they usually really are. <laughs> Uh, and therefore, um, inexperienced civil service ministers and so on often leap on them as a sort of crutch uh, for decision making without seeing them as uh, as flawed but useful tools, which is probably the the, the 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 better attitude to have. And that I think you can do through fairly you know, fairly simple, fairly quick training, just going through two or three examples. Uh, and helping people understand and then giving them say these small number of questions you should ask of any model which is being offered to you as a tool for decisions but keep it simple with them great thank you so we do have a whole host of questions which have come in on the chat uh, and the q a and some really interesting comments um let me go to a question uh from deepak jiawali who says uh Jeff, saying we need, um, especially when social behavior is being modeled, multiple models that can argue with each other, 
on SDGs, how many good ones are there that you know? And which warring intellectual villages do they come from? For, exa for example, between environmentalist versus market uh, versus control freak government models. Uh, Jeff, why don't you come in and then I will go to Erica on, on that question too. Um, well, I'd love to hear from others on, on, on those. I mean, as the question implies, often models do come from a particular intellectual background. So obviously anything to do with uh, economics has its own very uh, particular views of what models should contain and what they shouldn't contain. Um, one of the interesting things in the last, I guess, 10 or 20 years is, is psychology beginning to influence economic models through um, the, the relabeling of psychology as behavioral economics. And that <laughs> at least has had sort of some influence on the edges. There's obviously the attempts at, you know, natural capital modeling and uh, uh, effects on climate, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm not aware of, uh, and this perhaps gets back to the question, can you really have a meta model, which takes account of so many different dimensions from, let's say, identity and behavior to economic dynamics to ecological dynamics without the whole thing falling apart? Um, uh, and, uh, and I suppose that's what leads me to this rather more modest uh, view of having, having simpler, less, uh, less comprehensive models and recognizing those will then be in tension with each other. There will be perhaps the environmentalist model, the sort of the control free government model, um, uh, which is perhaps, uh, you know, every government would like an input output sort of model in which, you know, you pull lever X and Y happens. Of course, the real world doesn't work like that at all. Uh, and perhaps this is just reinforcing the case for having two or three in balance. And so if you're in, in practical terms, um, I mean, for example, over this year's we'll work with quite a few teams on uh, uh, UN teams around the world on, on a waste and recycling strategies in, you know, mainly cities across the global south. And for those, actually, they're, they're good examples of where you need multiple kinds of model, because any waste activity, it involves in some ways some quite straightforward physical sort of input output dynamics for you know, paper and plastic and glass and so on. There's an economic way of modeling how incentives will change behaviors and you know, demand will elicit supply. There's of course a set of ecological uh, and environmental dynamics to be looked at as well, but which are, are, are largely different. And then there's the behavioral questions. How do you actually get people to separate their waste, not chuck it all in a, on the street or on a landfill? But I'm not aware of anyone who can pull those all into a single model, which could guide you know, the city of Accra or wherever in terms of its waste policy. But I'd, I, if anyone does have such an example, it'd be great to hear. Erica, I, I just want to get your thoughts on this, but perhaps from a slightly different angle, because someone else has asked, do the speakers feel it's now impossible to stop models becoming politicized, uh, especially if they're used to shape policy or legislation that may affect the wider public? So, I mean, just you know, to make the connection, if we're talking about multiple models sometimes conflicting, uh, is that a, a product of a politicization or is it something else? That's exactly the point I was going to make, Joe. So thank you for preempting that. Um, yes, I think, you know, we, as Jeff said, we need multiple models, uh, you know, and so that they can argue with each other, but so that they can also be in dialogue with each other about the, um, the quality of the assumptions that they make and so that we can test them against each other. If you only have one model, it's essentially impossible to say how good it is. If you have multiple models, then you can start to say, all right, we have, uh, you know, we have these three models and they give us different outputs in these different ways. And then we can start to interrogate how the assumptions lead to those different outcomes and, uh, and get some idea of, of what, the, what the really robust outcomes are. Obviously, if you've got three models that you've produced in a completely different way and they all come to essentially the same answer, then that makes you feel much more epistemically confident about, about that answer. Um, whereas one model by itself can't generate that form of confidence or it only in other ways. So exactly that point then, it, it, it is impossible to stop model, models becoming politicized because models are political in, in their development. You know, every model is developed by a human who chooses what it is that they want to model and what uh, variables and values they prioritize in the construction of that model. What are the things that you leave out? 
whose perspectives and whose um, priorities are going into that model. Um, and so, so every model is coming from some political position, if you like. Uh, I guess the question really is then how do how do we stop it becoming uh, polarized rather than politicized to avoid people sort of latching onto one model as being somehow confirmatory of their own pre-existing biases and uh, choosing it because it supports the outcomes that they want to see. And obviously you can see that in the COVID debates, you can see that in climate change, you can see that I'm sure in almost every situation where you have multiple available models. Um, and really from my point of view, the, the, way to, the way to not stop that, but to avoid perhaps the polarization rather than the politicization um, is to have a more transparent process of model generation, which takes into account uh, different stakeholder perspectives and and um, and takes a co-production approach, if you like, to um, to generating these models in a democratic way, um, it being transparent about what the assumptions and value judgments are that are making it up. Fantastic, thanks. And I think actually there's a a, a comment, a question in the chat, which kind of relates to, to this issue from Ina Steenman um, says, super insightful contributions, thank you. What do Erica and Jeff each think about the value modeling brings in their process of construction, not their eventual use? Perhaps overly provocative, but should governments engage in, mo engage in modeling as a way of refining our theories of change? around both these uh, meta as well as more issue specific policy issues. Would it be responsible to invest more public resource into modeling for group-based learning and not their application? Or should the resource go on enhancing the use of their outputs? Um, Erica, should we come back to you first? And then... <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, I think I, first I'd say, I think actually that is what happens in practice already. I think that um, the value of modeling is to a great extent in the practice of modeling rather than in the outputs. And actually I've just been at a workshop um, recently the last few days on uh, seasonal, for seasonal weather forecasting. And um, it, you know, it's re been really interesting to hear the uh, people in operational centers actually saying, well, you know, there are these outputs, but actually you know, we really see the outputs as being conversation starters rather than products per se. And actually, a lot of the value of the modeling, even in that really technical, uh, highly quantitative, something where we do have the ability to assess the skill of the model retrospectively as well, even in that circumstance, actually the value of the modeling is also in the process understanding and, and this sort of uh, dialogue between one modeler and another of, of uh, what are we trying to do here? What, is the, what are the influences on these outcomes? Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, as you go sort of along the spectrum to models which are more uh, uncertain, that are models of um, sort of human behavior, as Jeff was saying, the more difficult, the, the, much, the much harder sciences, as I like to call them, um, then, then you get much further into the domain where actually the main output of modeling is the process and the insight that's generated and not the quantitative predictions. So I totally agree with Ina's point there, but uh, I don't think it's overly provocative. I think it's absolutely right um, that governments and scientists, researchers do engage in model as modeling as a way of refining our theories of change and as a way of coming to understanding of what the logical conclusions of our assumptions are. Um, so I think, yes, more public resource in modeling for group-based learning would be great. And that's essentially already what we have. The question is more not to fetishize the, the numerical outputs as being the output of the modeling process. Really interesting. Jeff, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, well, certainly I'd agree with, with both Ina and Erica. So my, my bias for a long time has been that almost any policy project, the first thing the team who are working on it need to do is map how they think the system works, whether it's labor markets or renewing you know, neighborhoods or, or waste. And you then get a, you know, a large map of causal dynamics, some of which will include quite formal models, but they're like to be only little bits of that uh, map. And those will reveal where there's gaps of knowledge, where there's gaps of power, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't do that exercise, 
uh, which I would say goes far beyond theories of change, but that's a topic for another day, the problems with the theories of change logic. If you, you, if you don't do that, then obviously you can't come up with any, any sensible policies or know what second and third order effects they might uh, they may have. And, and my, I have a slight fear that in, in some countries, some of the skills in doing that kind of basic systems thinking have actually deteriorated in recent years. Uh, and yet those create the context in which models of all kinds are most useful. Can I just make one comment on the, the politicization point? So I think there are different kinds of, and Eric has alluded to this, different kinds of politicization. I think politicization when particular you know, factions simply deny any evidence or refuse to engage with models, that is a bad politicization. But there's a good politicization when people ask good searching questions and models being used to drive very important decisions. And many of the models used by World Bank, IMF and others were deeply flawed in the past and it was correct to politicize the models and challenge them. Uh, equally, there's some quite good examples of very political uses of models, for example, in uh, in very local urban planning, where communities could literally play with models of how, you know, different buildings or transport patterns, you know, would play out through, you know, uh, through simulations. And obviously, many people use SimCity as a uh, as a fun version of that. I think agent-based model models are becoming just more and more usable now for exactly that kind of dialogue with a much wider public about how something like uh, a new subsidy or training scheme or small business support might play out in a particular field. They haven't been used that much yet, but I think five or 10 years uh, ahead, we could picture much, much wider engagement with different kinds of models, again, to think through you know, how, what, what effect X might have on Y, Z, and so on. And again, that's, that to me, that is a good politicization when models become uh, more widely owned and not just the preserve of, of the modelers. That's great, thank you. I actually want to go to a question now from uh, Kishab Das, and I think it does relate to uh, the your previous comments, Jeff. Um, Agent-based modeling can be wonderful, but it can be very resource intensive. And, and Kishab Das is asking, uh, especially in the SDG context, health and sanitation, for instance, when we have poor databases in developing countries, what should be the first step? Improving data collection or working towards models? A critical reflection on sector-specific data quality may be a useful first step. Um, could you reflect on that? So yeah, with, with kind of resource limitations in mind, where to begin? Yeah. You know I mean? yeah, okay. Then, so yeah. um, it's a really good question. And I think it all depends on what you think is the generalizability of, as it were, the, 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 the causal theories. So if you think essentially what we know about the effect of sanitation uh, uh, policies and designs on public health, if you think those are fairly universal from, you know, Brazil to India to to uh, to Congo, then you don't actually, then you can do a lot without having very good local data because the causal dynamics are fairly well known. Obviously it's good to have that data, but you don't need to wait for it in order to use models to guide uh, implementation. Uh, and there will be you know, some fields in which knowledge method policy is relatively generalizable. And then others where it's much, much more um, dependent on uh, context of, of culture or politics or, or again, it could be housing design, urban design. Uh, and in those cases, then obviously the payoff from uh, local data collection will be higher. But, um, but I, I can't see how there could be a general answer to your question because it's, it, it's almost an epistemological question of the status and nature of the different kinds of knowledge, which across the SDGs vary hugely from things like, you know, weather or climate dynamics, which are in a sense, they're universal I and mean, they're guided by the laws of physics to, um, to issues of family policy, let's say, which are, uh, and, uh, and often some gender issues, which are much, much more uh, context defined. Mm. But again, I'd love to hear others answers to these questions, which would be much smarter than mine. <laughs> Uh, Erica, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, um, I'd agree with Jeff in general that you don't need to wait for data to generate a model, you know, if you have confidence in the underlying patterns of causation that are happening. Um, 
on the other hand, you know, I think that uh, data do need to be prioritized because there's always a risk with these kind of models of them sort of gradually drifting away from reality and becoming unanchored. And the only thing that we have that can anchor us with reality is real world data. Um, and I mean, the other thing to say on data is that there's only one opportunity to collect it. So if you don't collect your data now, then it will be gone. Um, you will never be able to collect today's data again because tomorrow today's data will be contaminated by the reflection of what happened tomorrow. Um, so I would probably prioritize data a bit more than Jeff implied there. And I'd say that if we, if we don't have enough data to adequately ground our models in reality, then we should be prioritizing that first before developing the models. So a slight, uh, I'll, get, I'll explain why probably I take a slightly different view. And it's probably one key experience was, was when we did a, a UK wide neighborhood regeneration strategy for basically for housing estates and neighborhoods which were falling behind and a hell of a lot of money went into it. Uh, overall, actually the evaluation showed it, it, it worked. But we hugely emphasized gathering ultra local data. The ONS did an amazing job of generating these uh, data sets to super output areas, you know, very, very fine grain, very sophisticated. Almost none of that was used in reality because there wasn't the absorptive capacity in local decision makers to, to use that data. And no, and none of the social science was really ready to use that fine grain data for decision making. So in retrospect, it was a mistake to over <laughs> focus on the data relative to perhaps the learning from action uh, and, and models. And that probably slightly over colors my view because um, I, I, I pushed for this massive data collection. We were all a bit proud of it. And in retrospect, it was a mistake. But then I suppose the question there is to is to is to make the model and the data sort of commensurate with each other. You know, you need a certain amount of data to calibrate the model. And if if you are able to say in retrospect that your the, the program was successful, even you know on some subset of that data, ignoring the rest of it, then yes, you collected too much data. Um, I suppose something also to consider is the degree to which the data actually matter. Um, I mean, in some, depending what your model is for, you know, there, there's this uh, idea that some models are an engine, not a camera, that, that it, rather than describing reality, they are actually creating reality. And if your model is something which is aiming to kind of uh, change the way that people look at a certain circumstance and change the way that people respond to it and, and sort of impose its own internal logic onto the real world, um, then the data may not actually um, make much difference either in the construction of the model or in the evaluation of the success. That might be something that you can do externally, but maybe it's important there to reflect on um, the sort of policy objectives of the model and, and also, again, to think about transparency and the interrogation of the values that are going into it if it's being used in that kind of way, mm. either implicitly or explicitly. You know, it may not be set up from the beginning to be, right, we are planning to change people's behaviour, but if it's, if it's something which in the implementation that is what happens, then I think we need to be quite careful. Very good. Coming back to some of the early themes in the discussion, actually, and um, we've got a couple of uh, questions on agent based modelling. So I'll, I'll just um, uh, I'll put those both uh, to you. Tim Foxen says, uh, what are the what are your views on the strengths and weaknesses of the use of agent based modelling in addressing sustainability challenges? And Maria Savona says, uh, interesting point on agent based modelling. We've been using them for some time now in economics of structural change but never thought of democratizing their simulations used by stakeholders and wider society. Have you seen this implemented so far? Is there any, are there any examples on that? So um, why don't I, yes, go back to Jeff first and then come, come back to Erica. Well, maybe linking those three questions and the one after it as well. So okay. um, the obesity foresight report, which is now I think 13 years ago, was actually, I thought, you know, a, a very good piece of work on something very complex, very behavioral, very, very cultural, though with also some uh, economic dynamics. And I would, I, I haven't looked to see how well, in retrospect, their model sort of has fared in the subsequent period of a lot of uh, policy actions. And uh, in a way, the learning on these things only comes from going back to previous 
attempts at complex modeling and then seeing you know how how, how well they um, either uh, the, the policies they led to actually worked or not or what happened or didn't happen and and so on and I haven't seen that done it's, it's perhaps one of the problems often with these sort of foresight exercises they're often one-offs whereas their their real value comes from returning to them every five or ten years and then improving the models but someone may have done that in terms of agent-based models well obviously like all models their strengths and weaknesses depend entirely in what you actually program into the agents uh, and and here too we fairly quickly run up uh, to the limits of social science so you could imagine Imagine an agent-based model for uh, obesity and obesity interactions. I don't know if anyone's done that, um, but it, it would bring to the surface, as Eric said, all that we do or don't know about what actually shapes behavior from social media messages to personal identity to, you know, the price of, of different kinds of food, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and um, so, again, they have to be ref reflexive uh, models. Um, but I think they can, uh, so I've seen some examples in, in Wales actually and in Canada of use of agent-based models for wider groups to participate in thinking through the dynamics of actions. And that's what gives me confidence that they could be used in the future in a, in a democratic way. Erica, um, yeah, over to you. And um, perhaps uh, you could get to Tim's point, which was specific to sustainability challenges. Yeah, um, I mean, the strengths and weaknesses of agent based models, I think, really are much the same as the strengths and weaknesses of uh, equation based models or um, equilibrium models. There's uh, obviously the potential for greater complexity, and that's a function of computing power as well, just as it is with equation based dynamical models. Um, and so I, I I suppose I don't really fundamentally see agent-based models as being different per se. Um, I know that they're uh, very fashionable at the moment. I think that there, there's a lot of opportunity to, to sort of feel like you're representing the individual better and able to better represent diversity. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but I think it's, it's a, quite a new field and it has it's not clear to me yet what the what the real differences will be there's I think a potential for greater complexity and the the feedback so as Jeff said the the necessity for models to be reflexive and to take account of these uh, feedback processes but of course um, you know dynamical equation based models can do that as well um, so personally I wouldn't see them be, as being dramatically different. Um, then in terms of sustainability challenges and the democratization of um, simulation use, I'm not really aware of any specific examples on that. So maybe I wonder if the audience might like to contribute any examples, perhaps do stick them in the chat box and uh, we can have a think about them. And maybe just to build on one, one aspect of this, which maybe is, again, a challenge to the audience. So a lot of the sort of late 20, you know, the second half of the 20th century, many models were essentially used aggregates. Nearly all the economic models were aggregates of GDP and exports and so on. And that was almost the dominant way of thinking was to look at means and aggregates. I think increasingly in almost every field from COVID dynamics to sustainability, you know, we recognize that it's the disaggregation, it's the segmentation which gives you insights. And in theory, agent-based models, you know, can really take that down to a, a micro level. But I guess any model has to decide, you know, how granular to go, how, how much to aggregate and disaggregate, which is partly then brings in computing power and cost and time. But my, uh, it's quite clear in health that a hell of a lot of research was still over aggregating, and most RCTs still are, relative to what we know. It's definitely the failing of almost all psychological research um, uh, that has done that. And I, so I think this is a big, both sort of theoretical and practical question of any modeling for SDGs or anything else is what is your stance in relation to aggregation and disaggregation? And how um, do you just uh, picking up on the question of computing resource as well. I mean, there's a tendency for models just to fill the available space and become as complex as the, as the uh, computing resource allows us to make them. Um, and maybe it's interesting to reflect here on the fact that, you know, we now have 
literally in a pocket um, a computer, the computing capacity that we had in supercomputers, say 20, 25 years ago. And what are we doing with it? Are we, are we generating the kinds of policy relevant outcomes from this greater computing power that we would have been able to do with supercomputers 20, 25 years ago? Um, or, or not, and if not, why not? Um, and what is it that the computing power has allowed us to do if it is not to get closer to those policy relevant outcomes of interest? Okay, we're running into the last few minutes, but um, I, I want to uh, just follow your comments, Erica, with a question from Jill Mortimer, who asks a kind of different side to that question, how to encourage policy leaders to get the full range of relevant experts involved. Early UK modelling omitted public health, um, stressed the iterative starting point, need to continue to sense check and refine, and so on. Yes, do you want to come in with just, yeah, and link also to operation and effectiveness with COVID, importance of local government for public health um, uh, was more or less omitted. I, if you want to. I think this just comes back to the politicization question, you know, that all models are created with some implicit or explicit political standpoint of, uh, you know, what are the agents for change? What are the kinds of change that can happen in this system? What can be usefully aggregated and what needs to be disaggregated? Um, and what can be completely neglected? And you know, if if there's uh, if if one whole aspect of a certain situation is omitted, that is a that is just simply a value judgment uh, on the point from the point of view of the modeler. Mm. Um, so yes, how to encourage policy leaders to get the full range of experts involved? I think I think that involves sort of defetishizing the models and and saying you know just because there happens to be a great model of this doesn't mean that this is the only thing that's important for the question. You know, for instance, um, in uh, you know the question of climate change, you know we have all these fantastic uh, climate models, and um, and they are incredibly helpful in helping us to sort of understand the potential consequences of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, what might be the local implications, and you know we can really see how uh, bad that potentially could be. But actually, we're still really stuck in debate about uh, economics and the sort of visions of the future. And it's, it's a clash of value judgments. It's not a clash about the climate models anymore. Mm. Um, so really, what I think the IPCC needs, for instance, is a, a working group four. So they have working groups one, two and three on technical stuff. They need a working group four on value judgments and uh, political considerations, questions of what it is that we actually want the future to look like and who wants different aspects and where we can find that common ground. And that can come, you know, that can be informed by the modeling, that can be really helpfully informed by the modeling, but getting getting those kinds of social science experts, philosophers, uh, you know, cultural representatives, they are experts too in a different end of the question, not on the mathematical modeling side, but equally important in terms of the decision, because for the decision, you need the information and you need value judgments about the uh, relative value of different outcomes. Great, thank you for that. I'm not sure if there's anyone um, from the IPPC on this uh, call, there might be. Um, we might have yeah. Arthur. <laughs> do you want to come in? We're running into our last couple of minutes here, but Je Jeff, do you want to come in on any of that? Well, very briefly, yes. I mean, I think the other thing needed to complement the IPCC is, as it were, a shared model of to help guide actions, net zero implementation plans of cities, regions and nations. And this, I guess, links to a, a broader wish I've had for a very long time, which on almost any policy area, and this was done a little bit uh, when the strategy unit was in place, government would say how it thought the system it was trying to influence worked. It would be explicit. These are the key elements and, and factors, etc., which then shows up where there are, again, gaps of knowledge or where it may be vital to involve local authorities or as on COVID, you know, where you may, may be missing crucial uh, dynamics. And if that's a living shared map, um, then that, that, that makes all of policy making far more intelligent and it's then possible to fit in specific models uh, during a pandemic. But I think this will be crucial for net zero strategies to have shared living evidence-based model guided maps of how the world works to help guide implementation to mirror the fantastic work that's been done on analysis 
of mm. climate dynamics, etc. But th there's a glaring imbalance, I think, at the moment in the world's sort of shared mental tools for, for action on climate. So what a great place to end with a focus on implementation and action. That sounds like a, a good strings place to, to end. Um, thank you so much, uh, Erica and Jeff. I think it's been a, a fantastic uh, discussion. And thank you so much to uh, those of you who've uh, listened and participated. We had some really great questions and I'm sorry we didn't get to them all. Um, I hope we'll have another opportunity. Uh, but uh, that's it for today. We're, we're at the hour. So thanks very much. and. Uh, and goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you.